on this episode of Edge of the Web. Do everything on mobile. Uh, whenever you, you make a change on your website, try it out on mobile. Like Ignore all of the mocks that people are sending you with desktop screens. Really try it out on mobile and actually try to buy something from your website on mobile. I think that's probably the most important thing that people can do now. Your weekly digital marketing trends with industry trend-setting guests. You're listening and watching Edge of the Web. Winners of Best Podcast from the Content Marketing Institute for 2017. Hear and see more at edgeofthewebradio.com. Now, alongside Tom Broadbeck, here's your host, Aaron Sparks. Hey, we're actually broadcasting from Edge Media Studios, downtown Indianapolis, Indiana. Every week we bring you the latest marketing trends and digital marketing influencers. You can check out all of our recent shows at edgeofthewebradio.com, and we're powered by Site Strategics, uh, your digital marketing pioneers specializing in the agile marketing strategy and, and execution. So you can learn more at sitestrategics.com. So uh, I'd like to jump in here and introduce our, our guest on the show here. And we've got John Mueller, who's Webmaster Trends Analyst at Google. Just for our listeners and, and everybody who's uh, on the live cast right now, he's, uh, I just want to give a quick bio about John. He's, uh, he's the Webmaster Trends Analyst at Google, where uh, he, we can uh, work with Webmaster Central, sitemaps, and, and search quality teams at Google to make sure that this information flows freely before webmasters and engineers at Google. So let's bring uh, let's bring John on the show here. Uh, go ahead and give him a shout. Hi everyone. Hey John. Hey John. <laughs> John, thanks so so much for joining us today. Uh, for all of our uh, web listeners as well as our live casters, uh, please check out all of the the favorite podcast platforms that we have over at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, SoundCloud. Spreaker, as well as ACAS, we are broadcasting on all of those platforms on a regular basis. Uh, we and, and we also implore you to jump into our EdgeCast. It's our live Facebook broadcast where we uh, certainly uh, uh, would love for you to ask questions of our guests as we broadcast. It's a, it's a fantastic uh, medium, and boy, are we, are we excited to be able to have John Mueller on the show. So, John, we've teed up a few news articles for you. Are you ready to go through the latest digital marketing news? That sounds good. Fantastic. Yeah, All right. More. Let's go. I was very excited to start my reportings. This week's trending topics. So from Engadget, and, and uh, this is uh, from the the writer Devendra Hardawar. There's a challenge right there. Yeah. yeah. Hey, AOL Instant Messenger is shutting down on December 15th. Tom, what is that all about? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty much it. It's, it's going away, and I'm just, I'm so heartbroken. That was such a, a big part of my childhood, and that's actually how my wife and I did a lot of, or when we weren't husband and wife, that's how we did a lot of our communication back in the day. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just wasn't sure if anybody had any other feelings. Caleb was, <laughs> I assume you were you were big on AIM back in the day, tying up your parents' phone line. Oh, absolutely. I, I still remember the ding, 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 sh- sh- you know, yeah. and uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's a big part I, of my I, childhood I, I, I as bet well. you had some stellar away messages. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sure I thought I did. <laughs> Aaron, were you on AIM? I was on AIM. In fact, uh, I was one of the early one of the early adopters of AOL, and uh, we actually tied in AIM to uh, ICQ, which was kind oh, of yeah. a network chat messaging. So you could pull in your Google Talk, you could pull in uh-huh. all of the different chat tools into one master account. John, do you remember ICQ? Yeah, I, I never really used that. Though. I didn't use AIM either. Um, I, I think part of that might have been because uh, AOL wasn't really that popular in mm-hmm. Switzerland. I don't know if they were even available here. Mm. Uh, but uh, I, I never, I don't know, got into the instant messaging stuff. But today you are, you are right, because there's going to be instant messages on, on Edge of the Web Radio. So uh, we'll certainly convey that to you. Um, yeah, I mean, it is, I mean, I, I think... If you think about it, it was the harbinger of the the, the Twitter environment. These quick messages yeah. amongst. I mean, it also goes back to the I, IRC channels way back in the day. Whenever you can actually dial into different chat forums, right? Yeah. So it was this this uh, the the primer of the social media. Yeah, that's quick, what, quick that's, uh, blogging. that's kind of my thought. Is kind of the first social network in a way, I guess. That it's just that quick communication. I feel like yeah. 
uh, that was kind of the the beginning of it all. Well, you know, all those guys or you know people now who are creating those uh, spam Twitter bots. You know, they had to get their start somewhere, and it was <laughs> creating aim bots. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Yeah. All right. Hey, from Barry Swartz over at Search Engine Roundtable, uh, Google uh, short webmaster SEO questions and answer videos are coming back around. So, Tom, give us a lowdown here. So I, I thought since we have the man on the show, he, he's mm. the one that tweeted it. So you can give us some more information about it. But uh, John Mueller, uh, he tweeted out that they're looking to do some a new, a new series of webmaster Q&A videos. So, John, kind of wanted to get you, uh, more on that. Yeah. Yeah, so we've, we've been doing the, the Office Hours Hangout for a number of years now. And uh, we, we noticed that, on the one hand, they're, they're kind of lightweight for us to do and that we can go through an hour of content fairly quickly and answer a ton, ton of questions. But it's really hard for people to kind of point at individual items within that hour of content. Mm -hmm. So more and more people are blogging about individual questions and linking to like minute 47 and whatever yeah. uh, within this video. And we wanted to make it a little bit easier to kind of really get quick questions and answers in on, on specific topics that are important to people. So we'll try to set those up again. Um, we're going to see how, how we can record them, uh, what, what kind of questions we want to cover, which of the older questions we need to redo maybe, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, take it from there, yeah. yeah. Any, uh, any idea who's going to be doing the videos? Is that with Danny Sullivan's joining your team now? Um, is that something that he's going to be doing? Or, do you, or I know his first day was like yesterday or something, so I don't, that <laughs> information... That was I haven't decided yet. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Okay. Uh, so I, I'll probably be doing most of these in the beginning. Cool. And uh, the idea is to grow that out a little bit and also make sure that we get some of our international team members to, to join in yeah. and do them in their own language. So yep. if someone in Japanese wants to do some of these questions or maybe some of these questions are more relevant mm -hmm. in Hindi or in Indonesia, then that would be great to, to have people do them in, in their own language. Because... Subtitles are great, but it's yeah. it's like extra effort to actually read and understand that. Yeah. So yeah. So in that article, we'll put it in our show notes as well. There's mm -hmm. there's the Google form to submit questions. Is that how it's always been done? Is that how Matt did it in the past? Um, I I think we did it in different ways in the past. Uh, at some point, we did it with Google Moderator, where you could vote questions up and down, gotcha. uh, which I thought was really nice. And uh, but Google Moderator isn't out there anymore, so we're or kind of taking what, what's available and just yeah. using that. Gotcha. Excellent. Cool. Excellent. Well, we certainly are looking forward to those videos because those were some great opportunities to hear inflections, hear what you're, I mean, yeah. there's so many, so many things uh, as we pay attention to Google, especially the webmaster compliance uh, and discussions of, of what, do, what do they actually mean by this? And to be able to actually see the videos and hear what you're saying, it, it can take a lot of, of uh, extrapolation out of mm -hmm. that and just, just hear you. I mean, I mean, honestly, uh, from, from the, the, the search side of things, you are the, the, the voice of, of Google in that space. And we really want to hear you say, uh, okay, you, you guys are doing the right thing here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Fantastic. Well, uh, last article from TechCrunch, another Google story, because we wanted to uh, certainly uh, uh, provide some, uh, some opportunity for our guests to speak <laughs> to it. Google's parent alphabet looks to restore cell service in Puerto Rico with Project Loon Balloons. This is from Katie Roof. Uh, if you have a look there, uh, the FCC has given approval for Google parent company Alphabet to help Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands regain the wireless service. The company will attempt to enable LTE connectivity using its high-flying Project Loon Balloons. Uh, this, uh, obviously, we are very aware of Hurricane Maria as, they, as it hit the islands last month, destroying access to basic supplies like food and running water. And 83% uh, of the people on the island are still lacking cell reception. Uh, John, you want to speak to uh, that? Obviously, uh, Google's a huge uh, organization, but this is a fantastic philanthropic ex uh, execution here. Yeah, I, I think this the, the whole Project Loon is, is really kind of almost like science fiction in the sense that if you were to go back in time, maybe five years and say, oh, Google will send some balloons around that uh, propagate the Internet or that can provide cell connectivity, you're like, 
that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it's fantastic what they've been able to do there to keep these balloons uh, afloat for so long, to control these balloons uh, through their, their complicated modeling systems. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm really excited to see what, what comes out of this. I think Project Loon is probably still in very early stages in that they can't just like say, oh, we will drop a million balloons or wh whatever they do to, to specific locations. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a nice test and it's an interesting way to, to help the people there to kind of see what, what we can do with the technology. Absolutely. Um, and kudos to, to them getting out there as quickly yeah. as they can. That's a huge endeavor. And uh, it, it demonstrates what they, why they've been developing this for, for such a long time, uh, because they're looking to cover the planet, to be able to give connectivity as, as yeah. to as much of the area of the planet as possible. And whenever a tragedy like this happens, to be able to see uh, Google be able to jump in there, uh, it's fantastic. All right. I tell you what else is fantastic. Joining the Edge of the Web Radio newsletter, <laughs> <laughs> we want to extend an invite out to for you all to join our newsletter. The, it's a free newsletter that covers everything that we're doing on the show and who we've talked with. Last mm -hmm. week we actually had David H. Lawrence the Seventeenth on our show talking about body language as it applies to uh, being on camera. Uh, so become an insider uh, into Edge of the Web and join the the insider group and find out who's going to be on the show next and what we're talking about. Uh, you want to stay on the edge with Edge of the Web radio newsletter. So all you got all you got to do is simply text to the number, uh, actually text the word Edge Talk to the number from your smartphone, 22828, and you can actually join right there or go over to edgeofthewebradio.com and be able to join right from the highly secured HTTPS uh, 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 form fill. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm doing some foreshadowing here. <laughs> all right. So follow all the featured trending topics at edgeofthewebradio.com. So let's find the edge with this week's featured guest. Now it's time for Edge of the Web featured interview with John Mueller, Webmaster's Trends Analyst at Google. John, thanks for much, so much for joining us in the news. And uh, for our guests who are just uh, joining us, our, our, uh, our Edge Cash watchers, uh, John Mueller is the Webmaster Trend a uh, Analyst over at Google, where he works with Webmaster Central, sitemaps, and search quality teams at Google to make sure enough information is flowing freely between webmasters and the engineers at Google's, uh, at Google, all the Googles. <laughs> Hey, uh, uh, so, John, you're uh, calling in from Zurich. Yeah, calling in from Switzerland, long distance. Fantastic. <laughs> and and uh, how long have you actually been in Switzerland? We know you've been there for a while. Oh, gosh. Um, I don't know. It's, <laughs> uh, good uh -oh. question. <laughs> Stumped them know. with the first one. <laughs> 15 years, something, oh my something like that. Oh. So originally, I'm from Germany. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in the States uh, for 10 years, uh, went to school there, and uh, finished school in Switzerland and studied uh, mechanical engineering here mm -hmm. in Zurich. And then had my own software company, and then somehow, I don't know, got integrated into Google. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, John is known for the Google Webmaster Hangouts, where he actually takes live Q&A uh, from webmasters and SEOs from around the world. And it's such a great outreach uh, to, to, uh, to have that type of open connectivity to Google. Um, so, John, tell us your, your backstory, your history. Well, you just did, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I guess when I had my software company, I started doing more and more on the web uh, with regards to kind of putting content out there, running my own servers, um, watching my servers get hacked. And uh, at some point, I, I, think, uh, I think kind of where this ties into Google, I was, I was looking at our company in Google and I was going like, well, our company is ranking on page three for its company name. So I think that's pretty good. Because you know Google, full of the internet is pretty big, and we're on page three for our company name. That's kind of good. And then at some point, I realized, well, you know, it's like our company name. Uh, maybe we should be ranking a little bit better than just page three. Uh, so 
that's where I don't, I don't know. I just got pulled into all of this around search and uh, crawling and indexing and ranking and trying to figure things out. Uh, sitemaps came out uh, around that time. So we made one of the early sitemaps generators. And through that, I, I got more involved with uh, kind of the, the Google community, the, the SEO side of things as well, and got contacted by, by some people from Google. So they, want you, they wanted you on the inside as opposed <laughs> to the outside, right? I, I don't know, but uh, it, it, was, it was pretty interesting because they, they emailed me on, on an email address for one of my domains that I never really checked. And then just randomly, I looked at the, that email account and it was like, oh, this email from Google. And it's like, is this really Google or not? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, huh. in, in the end, it all worked out. So well, sometimes it, you have weird coincidences. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, you got more and more involved in understanding SEO uh, way before being in part of Google. And it's very addictive. And, and back in those days, I mean, we were seeing some huge changes um, as we would make these 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 content changes or structural changes and that was kind of the wild wild west of of SEO for lack of a better description and you had a lot of uh, uh, black hat techniques that were taking ground and uh, it was a bit of a challenge making sure you stayed on the the tried and true and and white hat side of things because I mean as we see as we saw it, there are a lot of companies that were just exploiting the algorithm as quickly as they could, and um, yeah, it's it's it was there was a almost an attraction for a lot of SEOs to get into that space because it was it was winning the day, right? So as Google started to re reengineer itself, uh, individuals like such as yourself got brought in to be able to push back on this space, correct? Well, I think it's not so much to, to push back and to prevent people from doing these things, but to at least spread the word about the right type of things that could be done. Absolutely. And I, I think that makes a big difference already because th these are people who, who are trying to do the right thing. They just don't know what to do. And they're just following random advice that they find on the internet. And uh, if, if someone can come out and say, okay, if you want to make a technically correct site, this is what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Then they're like, okay, fine, I, I'll do that. So I think that that aspect is is really one of the important changes there, and what what probably also helped a lot is that uh, everything kind of became a little bit more mainstream. And that uh, if you put a bookstore online, then suddenly you compete with all of these known brands that are out there, and it's not the case that like some random spammer can just put a one page website up and say, oh, I have some books on my website, and you can buy them. Uh, you really kind of have to take things up to to another level from a quality point of view as well. And and we truly appreciate that, and as, as well as the speed in which Google is reacting to changes on sites now. Um, I mean, just in the day, I just remember whenever I'd make changes um, uh, from a, from a sizable SEO execution on a site, I'd be seeing changes reflected in three to four months. Uh, and and now we're literally seeing instantaneous response from Google as we change course, as we ad ad adjust uh, schema, as we adjust different factors. We're seeing such a a, a quick response. It's just it's just fantastic. So, yeah, that's that's a fascinating. I I love how that works out. How uh, the the engineering teams here at Google are able to kind of take take the web as it comes and process it as quickly as possible to to get it out there. Yep. Well, we certainly entreat our, our Edgecast uh, watchers on Facebook to join in and ask any questions of John. But we had a, a we have a truckload of uh, different questions in different <laughs> in different channels here. So uh, we're going to we're going to take uh, Take this time with John and ask up a, a few things uh, that we've been at, wondering about. And uh, first thing is is literally the the one of the most pressing uh, SEO changes and and anticipated changes. That's the mobile first index. Can you uh, give our our, our uh, audience uh, a bit of an insight of what mobile first means? Okay, so. In, in general, what we try to do with, with our search results is to provide the content that the average user would see when they, they view a page. So uh, up until, I think, a couple of years ago, like pretty much everyone was always active on desktop when they were active on the internet. So 
that was the experience that we wanted to reflect in the search results in that uh, if you're searching for something, you should find something that matches what, what you would see in the search results. And with the change over the years that we've seen recently in that almost like in, in all areas, um, the majority of the internet users are on mobile. Uh, we see some, some amount of internet users that are only using the internet on their mobile devices. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that the search results kind of reflect that. So that uh, the experience that you would see on your mobile device is what you would see in the search results. And uh, that's, that's kind of the change what we're trying to do in that we are going to index the web as it would appear on a mobile device and use that for the basis of our search results. So the, 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 the game shifted about 2014. Uh, I think that was the, 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 the apex where mobile actually took over desktop, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so when can we expect to see the mobile first index rollout? Um, we're trying to do that in, in a way that uh, doesn't uh, disrupt things too much in the sense that uh, we, we know there are a bunch of sites that have problems with this and that maybe they don't have the full content on their mobile pages. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they don't have the, the same images, the same structured data, all of that on their mobile pages as well. And uh, because of that, we want to take things step by step. So the idea is on our side that we're building a classifier to recognize when a site is ready for mobile first indexing. Hmm. Then as things kind of move forward, we'll say, okay, well, these sites are ready. We'll switch them over to mobile first indexing. And in an ideal world, they wouldn't have to do anything more past that. Uh, but obviously, the, the plan is still to move the whole internet over to mobile first indexing. We don't have a deadline for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll probably be taking things a bit slow, kind of step by step. Uh, but at the same time, we want to bring out all of the information so that sites know what what they should be watching out for, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of tests they should be doing to make sure that actually the mobile content is really equivalent to the desktop content. Usually it won't be exactly the same. Uh, on mobile, you don't have things like this wide sidebar or flashy banner ads on top, or you have them in different ways at mm -hmm. least. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the kind of things that from our point of view are, are totally fine to have on mobile. and. Uh, the kind of differences that, that are kind of normal on mobile, but the primary content should really be equivalent. And the functionality also needs to be equivalent. So if you're, I, I don't know, a, an insurance company and you have a form that has a calculator on it to calculate the rates, then that should be available on mobile and that should work on mobile as well. No, uh, I, I, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, so is your advice, uh, to organizations that actually have a separate mobile site, and we've seen that uh, be developed over the last five to six years. Um, and obviously, we paid very close attention to uh, you know, the the mobile change in April of last year. Um, is your advice to consolidate all this content into a responsive website, not having these two these two uh, assets out there that could be uh, a, 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 not a distraction, but they could be a dissonance between uh, the, the brand's content. Um, you, you can do it either way. So we, we think having a separate mobile site uh, or having kind of a dynamic serving site where you have a separate site on the same URLs is, is perfectly fine as well, uh, just as responsive is. I think for many sites, having a responsive version makes things a little bit easier in that they don't have to watch out for all of these different variations. Mm -hmm. They don't have to test the structured data on both of these. They don't have to test the images and the videos on both of these. They can be sure that if it works on desktop and it's kind of visible on mobile as well, then that should just work. Beautiful. Any, any gentlemen, any uh, questions on the mobile side of things? Yeah, I want to ask. <clears throat> excuse me. I want to ask about backlinks. Uh, generally, people link when they're linking to each other. They're linking through a desktop. How's that going to work with the, with the mobile first, especially if you have a mobile specific uh, website? Um, that works just the same. So just as we have it now, where so I'm assuming that's a situation where you have separate mobile URLs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we have it now, we, we associate those two. So we know this is the desktop version and this is the mobile version. And we see this link between them with the rel canonical and the rel alternate media tag uh, to kind of let us know that these are equivalent URLs. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, when we see a link to one of those versions, we kind of apply it to both of those. 
So similarly, if someone links to the mobile version, then that's that's a link that also counts for the desktop version. Gotcha. So that should just kind of work out. I think the the one thing when it comes to links that uh, I'm I'm a little bit worried about that I sometimes see on sites is that the internal linking is actually kind of suboptimal on mobile. Right. And that they'll have a smaller navigation and maybe like reaching individual parts of the site is a lot harder. Uh, so that's something maybe to watch out for or to to try out when when you're evaluating a site. Um, to 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 couple to uh, Tom's question, and this this may have no merit, but as we got to think about the mobile indexing, um, backlinks from responsive sites as opposed to non-mobile sites are those going to have any any particular metric in the mobile first indexing? I don't think so. Right. I, I don't think we would do that. Yeah, I, I think these are just normal links. Yep. Uh, if we have them on the page, we have them on the page. Um, maybe, maybe kind of watch out for rel no follow or or like normal followed links, mm -hmm. in the sense that if you're using rel no follow for user generated content on your desktop site, kind of make sure that you have the same setup on the mobile version as well. Uh, that's kind of something subtle to, to watch out for if you have separate mobile URLs. Excellent. So is there anything in this mobile first index that makes it easier for the Google algorithm to do versus the desktop side of things? Like are they able to spider something easier or the, like find content easier or, or, or something? I, or, I don't think it makes it easier per se, but uh, it... Or do you discover something I, new doing it mobile first versus the desktop? Yeah, so so I guess from from a crawling point of view, it's uh, I think there are two aspects which are really kind of neat. On the one hand, we're crawling the web with a normal browser user agent essentially, okay. uh, whereas previously the Googlebot user agent was this very artificial thing and it wouldn't map to any particular browser. So that's that's one one kind of change that I find kind of interesting. And uh, the other thing that uh, kind of surprised me a little bit uh, initially was that pulling out video content from mobile pages is apparently a lot easier than doing that on desktop. Hmm. Because on, on mobile pages, you tend to use the HTML5 video tags and kind of the, the standardized way of embedding videos. And on desktop, you have these complicated players with mm -hmm. JavaScript, previously with Flash. Uh, so that's something where... Uh, the engineers initially thought, oh, this was going to be a big pain when people move to mobile-first indexing that we won't be able to get these videos. But it turns out that it's actually a lot easier to index the video content that way, which I think opens things up for some sites that haven't had a chance to actually figure out how to do video indexing properly. Then suddenly, with the mobile version, it, it just works. Well, that's that's interesting. Uh, it just it's just the native environment, yeah. and all of a sudden, uh, these native players for HTML5 uh, already come baked as standardized <laughs> content. That's aw that's awesome. All right. Um, well, we want there's a linkage here to our next our next series of questions. Uh, it has to do with AMP. So we've okay. got mobile out there, and AMP absolutely has been a focus for Google uh, for a number of years. We remember it really being um, introduced at SMX two years ago, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, uh, although it was being cooked up for several months prior to the announcement. But it's been, it's, it's been a, a prime focus for SEOs uh, and understanding why AMP is so important. Uh, um, for our, our listeners and our audience, can you uh, briefly describe AMP and the importance that AMP has to, to, to Google from search content indexing? Oh, gosh. Um, so I, I work with the AMP team a little bit on the side. Uh -huh. So I, I don't have the, the perfect formulation of what, what <laughs> uh, AMP is in three words. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of a, a disadvantage now. But uh, from from my point of view, what, what I see with AMP is that it's a it's a really easy way to make really fast mobile pages uh, in, a, in a way that also allows them to be cached on a CDN mm -hmm. so that uh, when, when someone searches for something, we can essentially serve that up instantly. So that can be preloaded through the search results so that when someone clicks on that result in, on the page, it's actually already loaded. It just needs to be displayed. So that's that's one thing where I think 
you you kind of notice that over time where if you're you're searching on mobile and you're just you just kind of get used to these instant results in the mm -hmm. search results. Especially if you're in an area where you have like bad cell coverage, if you're you're traveling, if you're on vacation or something, then clicking on the AMP results is always a way of like really getting that information as quickly as possible. So uh, in, in that space, uh, and, and I completely understand uh, the, the 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 mini Venn diagram here. Um, should in your assessment, should every website? Be uh, uh, getting themselves into into AMP and using AMP as a as a supported technology. I I think at at the moment uh, the difficulty is kind of the supported elements within AMP in that uh, there's some parts of a website where currently if you're programming that directly yourself you're doing something fancy with JavaScript uh, uh, maybe something server side fancy as well then some of that might be tricky to do on, on amp mm -hmm. uh, but more and more the, the, these amp elements are coming out that actually support a lot of this so for e-commerce I've seen they, they've done a lot of work to actually make that work a lot better and I I suspect over time, for, for a lot of types of websites, setting up AMP will become easier on the one hand. Uh, so you don't need to do any of this coding yourself. Maybe you can just activate a plugin and turn it on. And on the other hand, it'll be kind of accessible for the kind of content that you have as well. So if you have a blog, that's something that's already really easy to do. You just like pull in the WordPress plugin, turn it on, maybe customize the layout a little bit to make sure you're not using that default AMP kind of view thing, mm -hmm. and uh, then you kind of have it done. It's, uh, it's not something that takes a lot of work. There's no downside to it, essentially. It's uh, just making your content available as quickly as possible. And I'm kind of wondering if you know it may, in the future, have a lot more prevalence or you know maybe importance, especially when the mobile-first indexing is you know fully rolled out, because as we all know, um, you know, speed is a big part of Google's algorithm, or, you know, mm -hmm. we assume. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> but also we know that, um, you know, from a speed standpoint, that's where a lot of sites suffer is, you know, from yeah. from mobile page speed. So, um, yeah. yeah and, it, and as users get trained on that little lightning bolt that appears in the, in the search result, you know, they know that means speed and that means fast. And that's so they're more likely to, to use that content that's delivered there in the, in the search result that has that little, that little icon. Yep. No, I, I don't know what, what the future will bring. So <laughs> like that, yeah. that caveat is, I, I think it's something where initially I thought like at a company like Google, they would make plans for the next year mm -hmm. and like we'll look up exactly what's happening next week or next month. And uh, I realized like if you want to move really quickly, sometimes you have to make decisions quickly as well. And you have to say, okay, we're going to roll this out next week uh, and we better get to work to make it, make sure it actually works really well. Or they'll turn around and say, okay, we wanted to roll this out tomorrow, but it turns out this, this one thing here that's kind of broken or that's not the way that we wanted it to be. So we're going to kind of pause this, and it might be a month later. It might be canceled. Uh, so these are things that are all kind of a part of the, the reality of when, when you're moving quickly. Uh, so I, I can't really look forward into mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, it's something where, uh, at least in the beginning, it was really important to us that we treat AMP the same as any other kind of website, so that we don't give kind of this specific technology any kind of uh, advantage in search rankings in the sense that uh, we, we like artificially push it too much. So we wanted to keep it as natural as possible and make sure that people implement it based on its own merits and not based on any assumed mm -hmm. SEO advantage. That, that might be associated with that. And, th and that goes to a lot of the, the, the uh, SEO interpretations over the years is that, that uh, the SEOs see Google take one step towards something and, and, and it's, it's human nature to clamor around this concept. I mean, we all know that authorship, uh, the rel author tag, was that huge factor that everyone thought was was a a a, a silver bullet for uh, for uh, great SEO rankings, right? <laughs> in one in, in one in one space, I mean, that was getting rel author on everything that you were ever producing, and Google decided, all right, well, we don't want it there. It's not really a, as valuable as we thought it was originally, and it really wasn't an SEO play, correct? Yeah, I I think 
that's that's always kind of tricky. On the one hand, at, at Google, we try to be fast in, in responding to things in that we, we measure kind of the reaction from our users. And uh, that's something where we sometimes see surprising things in that we, we assume users will respond to this by, by doing more of that or doing more of that. And when we test it, it might be completely different. And similarly with, with authorship, it was something where we, we assumed this would help people to, to kind of recognize things or handle things in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And it turned out maybe it wasn't uh, the right approach there. I think the tricky part there with authorship in general uh, was that it relied on sites to do a lot of work on their end. Yeah. And that, that really kind of made it harder for us to say, OK, this experiment isn't working out. We were just going to switch it off. Uh, so we were really kind of reluctant for quite some time to say, OK, um, how do we tell these people that, that we don't actually need that markup at the moment? Mm -hmm. But I think the, the good part that kind of came out of this is that people thought a lot more about uh, semantic markup on their pages and things like schema.org and the JSON LD markup. All of these things are now topics that, that webmasters implement. And it's not a matter of whether or not to implement any kind of structured data markup. It's more like, which one do I use? Like, there's so many different options. Mm -hmm. And maybe this was the right one for me. And maybe this other one is the right one for me. Uh, so I think kind of moving things from just pure HTML to actually thinking about structured data behind the scenes, that, that was actually a really, really interesting move. And, and that's what SEO should be paying attention to now, is, is, is understanding the entire uh, tapestry of, of options that they have, is that there's a recipe that every SEO can actually bring to the bear. It's not just a checklist, right? And, yeah, and I like to think of myself as a chef. I like to think of you as a chef as well. But more, you're, yeah. you're a brewmaster than a chef. I mean, come on. Um, that, that is a great example of the kind of the hypersensitivity that has been in the SEO field as they're paying attention to, to Google's communications. And, and um, it, it, it did give us a bit of pause going, all right. They're, they're moving fast over there. Um, and I, I do remember a conversation with Google where well, Google actually opened up and discussed with a lot of SEOs. And one, one of the SEOs challenge, challenges that they gave Google was stop moving it so much, you know. But, but you're, you're in the business of providing that user experience to your consumers. That's, that's your main goal and making sure it's an optimal experience and making sure that the consumers are getting what they're looking for when they're looking for it. So as long as uh, uh, as long as we in the SEO field realize that's that's the goal here, then we can certainly get all of our ducks in a row to be able to help support that that mission. Um, speaking I, of, I think, go ahead. I, I think it's something that always has to work together. So it's not something where in in isolation we can say we're just working for the users. Uh, it really requires that that we work together with webmasters and publishers to make sure that the, the content that they're providing is also reasonable and to kind of guide them into the technically correct ways of implementing certain things so that we can crawl it a little bit faster, show it a little bit better in the search results. And all, all of this kind of requires that we, we work together. It's not something where we can just say, well, we're working on our users, and what you SEOs back there do is like not really our problem. Uh, we, we need to work together. Very good. Uh, speaking of work together, we actually have a, a question from our audience. If, we can, if, I, if I can pronounce this in one, one shot, it's going to be fantastic. Is Jiron Stickelorum. Uh, <laughs> Uh, bear with me, Jiron. Uh, he asks, what is the best way to do log file analysis? Do you have any insight into that? Yeah, I, it's, I, I think it's really fascinating to look into your server logs. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I imagine it depends a lot on the way that you're actually hosting your content and how you're working together with who's, who's hosting your content. So especially at larger, larger sites, larger businesses, you're probably not just going to get uh, that log file emailed to you because it's gigantic. Mm -hmm. Or maybe there are like privacy or policy implications around that log file where maybe you don't even get access to it at all. Um, I think there, there are some really neat tools out there that I've seen that to analyze your log files to figure out like where Googlebot is going or where users are going and trying to figure out like what can be done to improve that. 
um, but uh, it really really kind of depends on on the, the options that you have available for for yourself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so there's no one one way but there is there is fantastic data to be to be mm -hmm. pulled out but you have to really know your site to be able to understand your log file right yeah yeah i i think that's that's always tricky i i think there's lots of information in log files uh, so in the beginning when i started with seo log files were were really what you focused on because mm -hmm. that's that's where you saw where googlebot was going through and where you can tell like oh google found this link and now it's crawling this part of my website and that that was really important to know and then you can kind of guess like it's crawling now that means maybe this part of content will be indexed at some point or maybe you see it crawling your test site or crawling your your staging site and you're like oh no like i need to get ready uh, to actually <laughs> stuff down again. So. <laughs> I saw that happen a couple times. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not ready for prime time yet. <laughs> um, uh, good question, uh, uh, Jorah. I appreciate that. Um, as it applies to um, consumers, we, we absolutely understand it. Not only is it the mobile first space, but it's also the voice search uh, space that is incredibly um, uh, important to be able to get right. So how many, how many changes are, are in the algorithm are due to the Google Home device and voice search that you can, that you can share with us? <laughs> I, I have no idea, actually. Oh. So, so number of changes is is one thing that that I really don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I I've been in in touch with some of the people that are working uh, together with uh, the assistant team uh, that have been working together with partners to kind of get their the stuff on assistant. And I find some of the the things that they're working on really fascinating. And it's something where I expect. I, I'm just making this this guess, so it's it's not based on any internal Google data or anything. I, I expect uh, some amount of shifting towards voice to happen. Um, I I have two Google Homes at home, two Alexas, and my kids interact with them every day, and it's something where. I see some kind of queries, they tend to shift towards uh, voice, and other types of queries, they, they stay on a device, usually a mobile phone at the moment. And uh, kind of the, the interaction at the moment is you ask a question, you get an answer. Uh, but there are lots of these assistant tools out there that, that are a lot more than just that, where you can actually interact with it. Uh, maybe you can order something. Maybe you have like a subscription to a service, and you get a special kind of information. All of that is, I think, really fascinating. And it's something where I'd encourage anyone who has a, a business that's online to to really think about like what what if we were 20 years in the future and uh, nobody had a screen anymore and everyone interacted by voice how would my business kind of remain relevant online what what would i need to be doing to be kind of uh, relevant in 20 years and then to take that prognosis for 20 years and say okay but what if this happened next year mm. and what could i be doing to to get there earlier and looking at the developer docs uh, for Google Assistant and looking at some of the stuff that's out there for Alexa, uh, there, there's a ton of information out there. There are a ton of samples out there where you can just take a spreadsheet and say, OK, these are my questions and answers, and I'm going to compile this as an Assistant app. And then suddenly you have a kind of Assistant robot out there that helps answer some questions that could be driving some business to your company as well. Um, I think uh, John just uh, gave us a, a peek behind the veil that Google's going to take all of our screens away in a year. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, not mine. <laughs> I like my screen. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so they're in the screen business, too. Yeah, they are. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, to, to, to double down on the voice surge, and I appreciate that insight. Uh, I, I truly do. Do you see uh, where organic traffic is actually becoming less of a priority uh, with the future of the growth of the home devices? Because we, we were paying attention to the, the top seven, the top ten rankings of organic. And obviously, Google changes uh, the, 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 uh, the topographical map, uh, so to speak, of, of uh, the consumer needs. But from the home side of things, you ask for something, you're only going to get one or two results. Does that radically change the pursuit of the organic, uh, or organic rankings? I don't know. I, I really don't know. So... I, I imagine there, there will be some shifting happening, but 
I, maybe there will also just be a change happening in that more people are searching on voice and uh, the same amount of people are searching on mobile or on desktop. And you just kind of have an additional growth area to, yeah, to yeah. look at as well. Oh, that's, that's, uh, a, that's a good point there. I, I really don't know. It's all right. It's all right. Oh, well, we're just rattling, uh, <laughs> rattling some questions at you. Hey, uh, one of our uh, our Edgecast uh, uh, viewers has another question for you. Uh, this is from uh, Michael Mitterhauser. Uh, I pronounced this one a little bit better than uh, the last uh, gentleman. Uh, question for John: If a user isn't completely satisfied with number one results and doesn't convert there, is 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 that bad for that website? So basically what they're saying, what he's saying is that if they're number one and they're not converting, what's happening and what can they, what can they extrapolate from that positioning? Any, any thoughts in that space? Um, it's, it's kind of hard to say because uh, I, I believe kind of what this is going out uh, towards is like, well, if someone is unhappy with the number one result, does that mean the rankings get changed? Yeah. And I, I don't think that, always really makes sense. So there, there are lots of pages where you look at the content very briefly and you're like, OK, I got it. And then you search for something else. And to just say that because someone is just briefly looking at a page instead of kind of interacting with it or putting something in their cart uh, to say that this page was bad, I, I don't think that really makes sense. Mm -hmm. so, so from that point of view, I, I don't think that's something that could be applied broadly and kind of used across the web. But uh, from, from a webmaster point of view, obviously, you know your website best. And you know kind of the expected behavior of users. And that's something you can react to. So if you see people going to your page, and they were searching for your product name, and they end up not interacting with your page at all, maybe you're doing something wrong. Uh, it, it really depends a little bit on what, what you're trying to do and what you think your users are trying to do on that page there. And that's something where I think every site is different. Every type of page is different. Every type of query that leads to a page is subtly different. Mm -hmm. Where you really have to bring in your expert knowledge and kind of use that together with the data that you're seeing based on user behaviors to say, OK, I'm probably doing something good on this part of my website, and this other part of my website doesn't seem to be working at all. It, am I like targeting the wrong users? Am I providing the wrong information? Is this just a product that nobody cares about? Um, mm -hmm. All of that is something that you can use this kind of data to to think about and kind of respond to that. It's very subjective, and yeah, you you have to have a full understanding of of the different delivery that you can do for your with your website and all the different areas. Um, so from a data standpoint, I'm going to segue into another question regarding another area of questions uh, regarding Search Console. Are we ready? Okay. <laughs> All right. So when will we be able to see the historical search query data in Search Console past 90 days? Okay. Um, I, I can't make a prognosis on that either, but I, I know the team has been working on that. Uh, so we've we've been collecting that data, and uh, that's something that once once they've worked out how to show that in a reasonable way in the UI, then they'll be work trying to bring that out. So it's something that's actively being worked on. Uh, I don't have any specific date on that. Uh, you, you've probably seen some of the betas that are out there for Search Console, and they're, they're working on various parts of the site to really shift things forward uh, a really big step. And uh, a part of that will also be to expand the data that's uh, being shown across the board in the various parts of Search Console. I can't wait to see it. Just... <laughs> That's my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think everyone's waiting for this. We, yeah. We've been talking about this for a long time. Uh, and uh, it, I, I, I really realize it's something that uh, would be fantastic to have there. In, in the meantime, I've seen a bunch of tools that use the API to pull out this information and to mm -hmm. kind of archive it on the side so that you do have some ways of getting older information. But obviously, when you start out with a new website, with a new client, and you want to look at like what happened last year compared to this year, uh, that's something you currently can't do. Mm -hmm. Well, we, yeah, we are certainly uh, interested in, in uh, seeing that. Uh, I'm going to poke on the other side from a Google Analytics standpoint. Uh, is there going to be any opportunity to get 
back our keyword <laughs> keyword <laughs> search data. Uh, I don't know. That's one that you probably can't answer. <laughs> the, the refer. I, I really don't think that that will come back. I, oh, man. That's, that's been gone for such a long time. Yeah. And uh, the the kind of the, the few keywords that are still out there in the yeah. refer kind of more like hold back experiments uh, just to make sure that everything is working properly. So I, I really don't see that coming back in in the same way in the refer anymore. You, you, maybe, uh, maybe there'll be different ways to kind of tie the, the existing search console data into analytics, uh, but not through right. the refer there. Well, you've just extinguished my last candle of hope there, John. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't know it was still burning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's been so long. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a long yeah. burning candle. <laughs> Get over it, Sparks. <laughs> I had a quick question about featured snippets, uh, John, um, or ranking zero. Um, is there something, if, if there's a search query out there that doesn't have a featured snippet there at the top, is there something that we can do with our content to trigger that? Or is that something that rolls out on your end um, if, there's, if there's not a featured snippet there in the SERP? That's, that's all completely algorithmic. Okay. So we see that kind of as a, a bigger snippet in the search results, um, kind of like the name says. So it's yeah. not the case that there's someone at Google like with a list of queries and it's like, yes, no, yes, no, and turning things on and off. That's that's all completely algorithmic. Gotcha. So if you have content that matches these queries and uh, provides an answer for users that makes sense to be shown like that, then I'm I'm pretty sure algorithms will be happy to try to highlight yep. it. Like okay. That. Oh, I just wasn't cool. sure if it was like just question specific or if there's like feature there's I see feature snippets for like top ten of this, you know. So I just wasn't sure like other yeah search I, queries that, that that don't have a feature snippet that. Uh, so it's just something if there's not one there, we could just adjust our content maybe and kind of try to trigger that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting with, with featured snippets because in, in the beginning when we started working with them, we heard from a lot of webmasters and SEOs is like, I, I don't want this. Google is showing too much of my content in the search results. And now things have shifted subtly in that everyone's like, how do I get there? And yep. like, how do I get my content shown mm -hmm. there yep. as well? And I think that's a, a fascinating shift to, to kind of really see how people embrace this, this way of showing things differently in the search results and sites try to pick that up as well. And uh, it's something where we, we've we talked with the, the team that, that works on this to see, like, maybe we can add, like, a schema.org markup type so that people can, like, flag things and say, this is what I want to have shown hmm. in my bigger snippet. But uh, in talking with them, they, they really want to keep it as algorithmic as possible and really focus on the content that you have on your pages and to let us pick that up in, in a natural way as possible so that we don't rely on technical kind of implementations uh, where we could theoretically just pick that up normally from a page. I love that answer. I honestly do. Because, I mean, it, at some point in time, you just have to let the content speak for itself mm -hmm. and be voted on by mm -hmm. the rest of the Internet. So as as and, and for our audience, I mean, there's uh, just to break that down, you've got those answers in the rich snippets, be able to have inbound links to that top, that type of content and how you are actually po positioning that information, that's all natural. That's all valuable, and, 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 and you, you're not going to be able to gamify it. No. Very good. All right, so a couple last questions. John, uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, again, um, from, from uh, a paywall first-click type of uh, discussion, uh, actually, Caleb, you want to ask this question of, of uh, our guest here? Sure. Um, so uh, the first part piece of this is, um, you know, if you can, how does Google handle content behind uh, a paywall? And now that Google has dropped the the first click free, yeah. So we we moved from first click free to a more flexible approach, which we call flexible sampling, uh, which I, I guess the name really fits there, uh, in the sense that uh, previously, I think it was three clicks per day, you had to provide the content for free for users uh, that were coming from search. And uh, we, we noticed like sites want more flexibility in that, in that sometimes, they, they want to take a little bit longer to actually show a paywall. Sometimes they want to show it a little bit earlier. Uh, sometimes they want to differentiate between the type of users that actually get the, this paywall in between. 
So working together with some publishers, it's something we, we kind of worked out in that uh, you, you can have more flexibility with regards to showing a paywall, with regards to showing a lead in, which is kind of like a, a snippet part of a page, mm -hmm. and uh, still providing the full content to Google, uh, ideally with a schema.org markup so that we can recognize this is the visible part of the page and this is the part that might be behind the paywall. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something where I think the, the flexibility makes it interesting for publishers in that they can also say, well, this is someone who has visited my site 10 times in the last week. Maybe it's someone who would be interested in actually getting a subscription and buying access to that. So maybe I'll show them and pay a paywall the next time I see them. Whereas other people might be there and it's like, oh, this first time ever on my website, uh, I want to make sure that they have a really good user experience so that they get to know my website and they get to like the kind of content that I have. And maybe I won't show them a paywall for a while. Uh, so that kind of flexibility, I think, is something that will probably take a bit of time for publishers to figure out what exactly they want to do there. Um, but uh, I, I hope it makes it a little bit easier for them to be a little bit more creative with regards to kind of monetizing their content, because a lot of people really have fantastic content out there, and they're just like dire to, to mm -hmm. find ways to monetize that properly. Right. And along you know, sort of those same lines, um, do you know, have you seen, have you guys seen much of a decrease in uh, pop-ups with the um, intrusive interstitial penalty? Um, when we initially announced that, we did see quite a change. So I, I thought that was really fascinating uh, in the sense that uh, we, we announced this as a ranking factor, and pretty much on that day, people would switch around their sites, and suddenly these interstitials would be gone. And uh, when, when you look at the, the external reports where they're trying to track like what this change actually means for websites, the, the change that they see is actually smaller than what, what we would figure out on our side, primarily because sites have responded to that and actually fixed a lot of these issues. Mm -hmm. So I think... That, that was really fantastic to, to kind of have that there. And thank you for that uh, from, the, from the entire <laughs> SEO community. There were so many, so many of these obnoxious. I mean, it was terrible. And still a lot of them are just ignoring it and just still doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had yeah. a question about duplicate content. Um, mm -hmm. So prior to my SEO, I worked for a TV station and I was the internet content producer and I was in charge of of whenever there was an AP story about a NASCAR race. And so I always work Sundays. And so when I, the NASCAR race was done, I'd copy and paste the AP story, put it on my website, and with a click of a button, I can publish it on 30 different websites within our within our sister with, that we're all you know, owned by the same company. Mm -hmm. How did Google handle that? Was, that, was I harming the, the, our, all of our sister affiliates by having the same piece of content on all the websites, or how does how how does hand, how does Google handle something like an AP news story that's on dozens of different websites? Um, so I, I guess what would happen at the moment is we would recognize that these pages are all unique, and uh, we we would look at the the page overall. We'd see like, oh, this is a this TV station, and here's the body of the article. And we'd see that these pages were essentially unique. And we'd try to index these all separately. Okay. And what would happen when someone searches for something that's within this kind of copy block of text, we'd try to pick one of these pages and show that in the search results. So ideally, the most relevant one for that user, maybe if we can recognize from the location, mm. maybe something matching, or maybe gotcha. they have a slight tweak in the, in the query, and we'd show that one. Uh, but from an ideal point of view, if you're doing this now, uh, what I'd recommend is picking one primary source and using the rel canonical tag on there to make sure that you're saying, well, I have it on these 30 news sites, but actually this is the one that I want to have shown in search. Hmm. And by having the rel canonical yeah. there, you're really strengthening that version. Instead yeah. of having all of these different copies that are competing with, with each other, you're saying this is the one that is really important for me. Maybe that's the, the local one for the news, or maybe yeah. that's the one that monetizes best, or wh whatever you have there. Yeah, it's a, because even still, I mean, that was uh, for national stories, but even like local stories, we had a station in Lafayette, Terre Haute, Indianapolis, uh, Dayton, Ohio, all with geographically located uh, close to each other. And so if something happened in Dayton, we'd share it 
with all, all of the local stations. And mm-hmm. if something, the president came to Indianapolis, Indianapolis would he'd share it out to all these other ones. And I was, I don't know, I always wondered how Google kind of handled that. So thank you for that. Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the important part there is that we try not to penalize websites for this kind of setup because it's it's really common. Yeah. And uh, the more common one is even like dub, dub, dub or non dub, dub, dub. You right. have the same content. It's like, uh, most most websites have that somehow yeah. some way or another and uh we, we try to figure out a technical way to handle that and that's kind of what we do with filtering things out and trying to pick the right one in the search results the the one situation where we would kind of take more manual action from a web spam point of view if we see one website is really purely copying content from other websites mm, yeah. and that's something where we'd say it's it's really not worthwhile to crawl and index this website at all it's like it's purely just a copy it's scraped or it's spun content right, right and that's something we can drop completely but if these are legitimate copies of of the same website and the same content and it's legitimate pages that's that's perfectly fine very good very good um boy there's so many different tracks we could go, <laughs> go down and thank you for for the time today uh, uh and, unless you and, want to stick around another three hours <laughs> we can do it we can do it <laughs> hey uh, a couple quick questions in the space of https uh how strong is that uh, uh for a uh, a ranking signal now because we certainly have, re- have heard and seen from google that you're wanting everything secure so can you give us a a, a quick thought about the https uh, from a ranking signal point of view, it's essentially the same as before. Mm. Nothing nothing crazy in the sense that you will suddenly rank number one if you're on page 10 uh, by shifting to HTTPS. Uh, it's, it's a more subtle change uh, with regards to ranking. But obviously, as this is very visible in the browser, you kind of have that, that user aspect uh, involved there as well. So if you have an e-commerce site and you don't have HTTPS, then users will see kind of that uh, insecure warning and that might be affecting your conversions more rather than your rankings. And the the conversions obviously were being affected with the the new release of the HTTPS form factor. Uh, how have you seen the, uh, the 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 web web community respond to that request of of making sure each and every form has has been as as under a secure uh, HTTPS environment? And we what we're what we're talking about to our to our listeners is literally having a um, a an insecure alert happening through Chrome uh, if you're going to a site that actually uh, has an unsecure insecure. Uh, um, uh, form. Can you speak to that quickly? I, I don't have any numbers on that, mm-hmm. but uh, one, one thing I, I have seen a lot of sites move to HTTPS for this. I've seen a lot of blogs write about like easy way to shift to HTTPS. I've seen hosters shift sites to HTTPS without the owners really knowing. Huh. Uh, so I, I think that it's fantastic to, to see how, how quick things move there. Uh, and I, I also like how how webmasters are understanding this as a technical issue and kind of treating it as a technical issue rather than some arbitrary rule that's mm-hmm. applied on them. And uh, it's, it's really kind of a, a technical thing. It's not, it's not made up. It's, uh, it's really just to make sure that the data that people enter into forms mm-hmm. makes it to the server without being intercepted in between. Yeah, absolutely. And even our marketing manager says that uh, his uh, and the search on the Android phone won't let him access sites because they're not under the SSL. So it's actually, like he says, baked into the technology now. So this is an absolute technical uh, aspect, but it certainly is a consumer and a conversion aspect, uh, to say the least. Um, a couple quick questions. Uh, I, I, I know, I keep on going here, but is there a question that you are tired of answering? A question I'm tired of answering? Not, not yet. Oh, not so, on this show. No, 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 no. No, I mean, in, in general, yeah. it's, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I try to answer the questions as they come mm-hmm. uh, because usually there, there's an honest reason why people are asking these questions. And if they can't find the answer, then I, I'd rather answer it myself than just to say, oh, I'm yeah. not going to answer you. You should figure it out yourself. Uh, because if they're confused, they'll just find more confusion online if they don't know what to watch out for. Absolutely. Um, well, a couple of years ago, pa- Paul Har uh, said, uh, SMX, that every, th- every time you, you open Google, you, you're part of a test. 
Uh, is this still the case? And uh, what what types of things are there still to test? <laughs> everything. 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 <laughs> Always making changes. I think this is something that that other websites should be doing more as well. So we're always doing these these kind of subtle A/B tests where we take I don't know tenth of a percent of our users and they see subtly different version of our site, which might be UI change, might be a few pixels here, might be some ranking changes, some I don't know JavaScript changes, all of these things that we're constantly testing them to make sure that uh, any change that we roll out actually has a positive effect. And similarly, to kind of make sure that older changes as well, that they're still kind of relevant. Because ideally, if we have, for example, an algorithm that we recognize over time doesn't make any difference for users, then it's better to delete that code and kind of get it out of our system than to keep running that code that actually doesn't have a, hmm. a big change for users. Very good. All right. Um, again, uh, we're 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 fa we're we're loving the conversation, but we do want to respect your time. Can we ask you what bugs you about your industry right now? What bugs me about my industry right now? I I don't know. It's uh, I think for the most part, it's it's interesting in that uh, there are. There's kind of this shift also happening between the technical side of SEO and the more content and marketing side of SEO. And I, I find that, that kind of fascinating to, to kind of see both of those sides evolve independently. So it's, it's not really that it bugs me. It's, mm -hmm. I don't know, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> well, uh, in the same vein, what excites you about, you know, about, about the industry? Because you certainly see a maturation and, and a, uh, I think SEOs collectively are, are starting to calm down. Based, based on what they witnessed from uh, Google. But can you tell us what excites you about the industry? So what I find really fascinating at the moment is kind of everything that's coming out of the areas that are less traditional web-oriented already. So when, when you look at things like China or Indonesia or India, where you see these gigantic economies and the, these giant groups of users and they've kind of evolved in their own ecosystem, kind of outside of the Western web, if you mm -hmm. will. And uh, I, I'm really curious to see how things will evolve when, when these systems kind of interact a little bit more. So when, for example, I, I don't know, the, a giant uh, Chinese web company goes and becomes more active in the Western web, does that mean that suddenly like our actions kind of shift towards like the, the Chinese way of thinking or like how, how does that mix go together? Mm -hmm. We start seeing, I don't know, more websites in Chinese, for example, and we start having to learn Chinese rather than expect them to learn English and be able to access our content. I, I don't know. Yeah, you're, you're, yeah you're, you're looking at that future thing, the, the Blade the Blade Runner-esque type of realm where you've got a mashup of of all different languages into into, into one space. That's what yeah. the future holds, right? I, I, I <laughs> that, that's really um, what, what I find fascinating is that we assume that like China is like so far behind and mm -hmm. they'll catch up with where we are. Uh, it might have just as well happened that they kind of leapfrog us and suddenly we have to catch up with what they're doing. Uh, so that's, I don't know, I find that kind of interesting. So there's no knowledge sharing between, you know, you and your uh, counterpart at Baidu, I take it. <laughs> I I don't know if they have anyone like, like us. I, I'm sure they, they have some people there as well. Um, it's, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's fascinating because especially with China, it's so gigantic that uh, it's, it's not that like, I don't know, a thousand people come online and like they'll go under on the Western web. If they all send everyone online from one day to the next, then suddenly the majority of the web will be Chinese. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what does that mean for us? Like, how do we have to evolve to kind of keep up with that? No, you're absolutely right. Is that there's a there's going to be a, a cultural shift into what is a common vernacular or common space of interactivity. You're not gonna you're not gonna have regional pockets. You're gonna be having a a, 
a convergence of of uh, uh, cultures and, and perspectives, and uh, we're already seeing it. I mean, the internet has opened the doors, and and as more and more users get into that space, you're you're going to certainly see uh, a, a change collectively across the planet. Um, John, thank you so much for all the time today. Uh, is there uh, something that we can promote for you uh, uh, and uh, and everything that you do inside of Google? Um, something to promote. I, I guess at the moment, uh, the important thing for me personally is we're looking for more Webmaster Trends analysts to join our team. So we have a job listing on our site. Uh, if you're a developer and you're into SEO and you love to talk about SEO and talk about the, the web ecosystem as well, mm -hmm. then make sure to check that out. Excellent. Excellent. Um, can you give us last question? I promise. Can you give our audience three things that they could possibly future proof their, their sites with from an SEO standpoint? Uh, from an SEO standpoint, so I, I think the, the first thing I would do is just test your whole website on mobile. So do everything on mobile. Uh, whenever you, you make a change on your website, try it out on mobile. Like Ignore all of the mocks that people are sending you with desktop screens. Really try it out on mobile and actually try to buy something from your website on mobile. I think that's probably the most important thing that people can do now. Um, second thing, I don't know. Like, I guess one thing that uh, I see a lot of sites uh, kind of ignore is really honest feedback from, from people who aren't related to the website. So doing a kind of a user study where you invite people into your office uh, to give them a task to complete on your website and watch how they interact with that. And oftentimes, you'll be standing behind them, and they're like, oh, I don't know which button to click. And you're like, I need to tell them, like, <laughs> you know, why don't you see that big red button that I put there? <laughs> but this, this kind of feedback is, is critical. Because uh, if you realize that users are having trouble with your website, then they're not going to convert well. And if they're not going to convert, they're not going to recommend your site because they, they weren't able to find anything. Yet. So I think that. Second uh, kind of testing is, is also really critical. And uh, I think the third one is kind of to, to think about in, in a future futuristic way to think about like what would your business be like if there were no screen for people to interact with. Kind of the, the assistant, the voice side that, that we talked about briefly. Kind of just like do some random brainstorming. Like how could I bring my information out to people if they weren't searching on on the traditional web on a on a screen with a keyboard type type situation. Well, that would probably help. I mean, honestly, from a you know fixing things from an accessibility standpoint too. I feel like so. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, John, thanks so much for your time today. Uh, for our listeners and our watchers, make sure you follow John on his Twitter handle John M U, and also check him out at Google Plus at uh, John Mueller on Google Plus. Um, uh, any final thoughts for our listeners and audience? Not really. No, this was really fun. Uh, thanks for having me. Oh, you're more thanks than for welcome. Coming. Yeah. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we're certainly going to be paying attention to the Webmaster Shorts and the Q&As that are coming up. Uh, we'll certainly give the lift as we uh, are. Uh, it's a great amount of content that's always coming out of Google. And we're certainly paying attention on the SEO side of things. Thanks so much, John. Thanks for listening to Edge of the Web Radio and all of our online uh, viewers. Uh, we certainly appreciate uh, your comments and your questions to our guests. And and uh, keep it alive. Share, because sharing is caring. Uh, thank you to all the colleagues over at Site Strategics. Uh, be sure to check out all of our must-see videos over at edgeofthewebradio.com. That's edge of, edgeofthewebradio.com. Uh, we'll talk to you next week. And uh, who are we talking to next week? It's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I should know. J uh, Ross Simmons. Ross Simmons yes. is coming up. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, I mean, I mean, John could have just dropped the mic there. And, and certainly appreciate all the time today. And we will talk to you next week. Do not be a piece of cyber driftwood. Bye-bye.